Yeah, my name is Bill Kasha. I'm the collection manager of the uh, collection of the artist Sarah Joyce. She's my mother. I'm the youngest of three children. My brother John and my sister Heidi are also involved with us in our family endeavor to uh, sort of explain and share the work that our mother did over five decades. Uh, Sarah's work was is multifaceted. It covers clay, fabric, multimedia, acrylic, and oil. This particular exhibit is a retrospect here at the Holter, and we're honored to be here uh, that Sarah was chosen for the inaugural opening of the new W space and to be sharing the exhibit space with Carla Potter, who's also an incredible local artist here. Sarah was born in uh, Arizona, in California, spent her early childhood during the Depression traveling all over with her family. She was the oldest girl in her family and um, it was a, quite a traumatic, I think, childhood for her. Um, Gila monsters, scorpions, snakes, all the different things that she was uh, encountered in the desert in small little primitive homes that they lived in and shared trying to find, trying to, father trying to find work. Her mother was quite ill, and one of the experiences that she had that had a big impact on her was um, she was helping her father deliver her two twin sisters. And the smaller, the second one of the sisters died at birth, was stillborn. And Sarah took that baby in her hands, put her in a shoebox, and wrapped it with tissue, and then her father took it out and buried her. So sort of kind of one of the multi many experiences she had. Uh, Sarah had a belief that souls that uh, die at birth, live on in other people. And when she got older in life, had a little bit of identity crisis herself, she decided to take on the name of that stillborn sister, who was Sarah Josephine, and she was, at that time, Joyce Kasha. She changed it to Sarah Josephine Joyce. And at that time, that sort of started on her exploration of multifacets of um, intellectual and artistic endeavors. Her, she had many, I guess you would say, um, oh, influencers. One in particular was Dr. Sven Liljeblad, who was a professor at ISU, who kind of a cultural anthropologist, who I think instilled sort of a cultural or an intellectual awakening in her and got her very involved in uh, etymology, linguistics, mythology, uh, Joseph Campbell, the readings of Joseph Campbell and Edith Hamilton were huge in that area. Uh, she started taking uh, classes at Idaho State University in um, ceramics and figure drawing that interest her as well as the cultural anthropology classes. And Hal Rigger, who was a, a noted primitive potter, gave her a lot of inspirations in her clay forms. And she had a clay studio that she worked at for years and years. Uh, and most of her work was broken in a big midden mound that she wasn't satisfied with or didn't want to keep. She also kept drawings and writings and different work that she did in paintings and she buried those also at that midden mound in a property outside of Pocatello. Uh, this would be in the fifth, late 50s and the 60s. She got a little, uh, I think, com the confinement of a potter's wheel and the kiln. She went more to the primitive forms, would go out and dig clay on the Snake River, uh, would get into, um, would go out and camp when I was a young child, and we would gather buffalo chips, cow pies, and do primitive cow firings, and some of the works that are here are of that form. The very few pieces that we have left of her actual clay work, because this is again over uh, probably 70 years ago, 60 years ago, are bisque fired, so they were kept inside, and they were uh, in, in a sort of a primitive form, as well as um, a few clay glaze pieces that we have left. She had a large clay sculptural collection, but when she moved to northern Idaho, she set these out in her backyard on a hillside on some buildings she bought that we were renovating, and uh, some kids came and broke them all with rocks, which was sort of a shame, but we do have quite a few of the bisque fire pieces. So that was some of her earliest work. Later, she had um, interest with uh, another a huge influencer would have been with uh, Carl Jung and his exploration of the subconscious or the unconsciousness and archetypal symbols that are, as he would say, come to you in a variety of methods, whether it's through dreams, gifts, traumatic experiences or dramatic experiences. And uh, Sarah became very involved in dream study and dream 
interpretation. And that became a lifelong quest for her uh, to work with her dreams. And she wrote in her journals every night she would wake up often making a sketch of the clock, what time it was when she woke up. Uh, she would write those dreams and she would also draw the dreams. So when you think about drawing a dream, it's an active endeavor, it's an active picture. So many of her drawings would show her, she would be laying in, or her, she shows a drawing picture of herself and her feet sticking out barefoot and a clock or a, or a moon or a star in the sky and then footprints and arrows and all kinds of action and motion going through uh, in her dream drawings. And so that was a huge, huge part of her, uh, her, of her world. And I often think that uh, she was consciously exploring, exploring her unconscious experiences. And so that was sort of the highlight. And I think this exhibit here at the Holter is highlighting that. Um, it was the title is, Am I Dreaming It or Is It Dreaming Me? Which is often something that she probably thought about and she wrote a drawing in, a, in her journal and a journal entry. And that journal entry has three specific, well actually has a number of specific art pieces in that journal entry. And they are out in the entryway. And Sarah uh, shared her emotions in her art, uh, whether it was depression, uh, social consciousness issues or ideas, uh, dramatic episodes with, that she had encounters with people that she met, and those were a lot of the basis for her paintings. Mythology also had a huge impact in her, um, in her life. Her fabric sculptures are sort of a unique form that she developed. They are, uh, she calls it um, agglomerate, which was she would get fabric and roll it up, tear it apart into long strips, roll it up into balls, and then she would take those balls and then start wrapping and shaping forms with those, and then covering that with um, very intricate hand-sewn details that evoke the image that she was after. Some of the um, fabric sculptures were based off, off of books, such as Miss Wren, who was a uh, dolls dressmaker and a manufacturer of ornate pin cushions, and that was from Charles Dickens' uh, book. So she was very, very interested in uh, literature and reading, and often used characters for, uh, of Yalta from the Talmud. The Jewish Talmud was one of, is one of her half-body characters. So they have their own life of their own, and she believed that uh, every object had an aura, and that was her goal was to capture that aura in her paintings or in her fabric sculptures or her acrylic or acrylic work. Um, her, her, the body of work that we have as a family consists of about 350 pieces of work. Uh, she was not interested in exhibiting when she was alive and her work was private. She said it was one of the luxuries of her life to be able to just paint and do and create as she wanted and not have to answer to anybody or explain herself to anybody. That was her own private personal uh, endeavor and exploration. So we've got quite a few pieces here we'll go take a look at and I uh, would love to talk about some of the uh, specific pieces. All right. So this is Arrow of Divination and it's uh, found many times in Sarah's journals. And an Arrow of Divination, according to Babylonian mythology, had to do when somebody had to create a, or develop an answer to a question or find a route or answer a, a, a problem in their lives. And I think that is reflective of Sarah's, uh, you know, how she might have gone about deciding where she was going to go or what she should do, what would be the best, what would be the best result for her or the best option. And in ancient Babylonia, they would often tie a note on arrows, different notes, and they would shoot them. And whichever one went the farthest, that was the answer to what they, the question they were asking. Or if they came to a split in the road, they would shoot an arrow on one path, shoot an arrow on the other path, believing that the gods were intervening and giving them the correct answer that they should go, which route that they should follow or where they should go. This is, a, I, I love the depth, the, uh, the layering of the painting. You can see she was very, very involved. She worked for, she would find weeks and, uh, or days and days working on a certain painting. And we never knew when she was doing it. I think it was during the nights, during the day. I never saw her uh, and I was involved with her as a, a building partner and, um, also a caretaker later on in her life. And 
I never saw her painting or doing her art. It was a very private. She would work back in her studio, and if I knocked on the door, she it would bite 15 minutes. She would come out because I knew she was putting her paint away and, and whatever. But it was interesting. She never mixed paint. I'd, I could see in her studio, she'd have a palette, and she would never mix the paint on the palette. She would always mix the paint on the paintings so that, and then change a the brush and work with the different colors. So um, I think that Paul Clay was a huge influence in her. Uh, his studies of color gave her interest in um, designing, designing color, and she had often said, lay down color first, it's the most important thing, and then the form and the shape will come later. Her journals, or 3,000 pages of journals, are, are filled with color wheels and color designs that she'd done. So she did all her color designing in her journals before she would actually, um, you know, often before she would start painting. So she had a concept in her mind, and a couple of uh, artists in Idaho have called her a, uh, a master of color, her ability to work with color. And that comes with, from Paul Clay, that the, his theory was the harmony of music, music harmony, was the same as color harmony. If they're in harmony, then the painting would be in harmony, and she was a firm believer in that. And really, really, if you look at her color uh, layering and the color work that she works on, it's really, it's, it's, it sets her aside in so many ways. Uh, uh, one artist told me that her technical skills were not superior, but her color was masterful. So I think that's uh, an important concept. Here is a painting here that I think is quite interesting too, if you look at the colors. That's called Small Voice Within, and I think for a woman who um, has experienced pregnancy and knows that that may resonate or, or appeal to, to that person, if you look at the coloring again, that just the layering and the, le the levels of the coloring are just, uh, just very, very unique. So these are some of her uh, primitive clay forms. They were bisque fired. Uh, I don't believe this clay was dug from the Snake River Canyon. I believe that this was uh, clay that she actually purposed, purchased, uh, and Serpentina is another of her clay forms there. They, she said the curve and the straight was the foundation of all art, design, and everything. Everything revolved around the curve and the straight, so that's what her clay forms work with. These are a few of her fabric pieces. This is double hump tweed. And you can see the still life photo where she has double hump tweed in her, in her, uh, on her church pew in her home that she had in Pocatello. So that's, uh, she often used her artwork in her paintings or her paintings in her artwork. This painting is called Four Martyrs and we didn't really understand where that painting came from um, or that title came from. We recognize those four women. In her journals she has a drawing of uh, halos and uh, different types of halos. This, hap this was done probably about 1990, and when uh, she was, Sarah was very well read. She subscribed to about 17 different magazines at one time, did not have a TV, uh, listened to NPR radio, but the readings she had were so diverse from uh, oh, archaeology today, astronomy, uh, scientific American, art in America, art history, but also many news magazines because that's where she got her information. In 1990, there were four missionary women in uh, San El Salvador who were abducted and uh, brutally raped and murdered, uh, and they were noted as the four martyrs. In Sarah's journals, we find the drawing because she would often do a sketch of the journal or uh, uh, in the journal of what she was going to be painting, and we find this image of the four martyrs and below that, and the dead rapists. So those, those fellows were, uh, that had committed those crimes were killed, and uh, that was her, her tribute as a social consciousness to those four missionary women. This is another social consciousness painting. It's called Erase, and again, we, had, uh, we knew the title of Sarah called it Erase, but we didn't know until I spent, oh, about 12 months researching and putting a data page together of all the journal entries because it was, it's quite involved. But this one has the title is Erase, and it goes, uh, Erase the Pain and Suffering, the Pattern of War. Again, it's another social consciousness, something that stuck in her mind that, you know, war was something that had really bothered her, she saw no use in, and had that 
that idea for that, that painting. Again, if you get to look really close at all the different layerings, and a lot of it is scratched, a lot of it was done with a spatula, small spatula knives, and a lot of it was brushed, but uh, again, a real different thing. Most of our oil paintings are signed. You can find the signature in, in lots of different places. I believe on this one, it's up in the very far right-hand corner, and she just signed her work, S-A-R-A -A period, Sarah. This is a section of work that Ramsey, the curator for the Holter, who did an incredible job of organizing and giving this body of work themes. She's sort of Sarah's wall. And I asked, I asked Ramsey, and I said, see if you can find Sarah's self-portrait among all of these paintings. The next, she walked, she kept looking around, and next, on the next day she said, it's that one. And I said, yeah, that was sort of a, her, a painting of herself when she was uh, towards the end of her life as she was getting older and you know more of a, uh, an elder, elder person. This is Lothar, and he's Lothar the protector, and he was by her bedside every night. That was her protector at night, and he sat on a pedestal, and in her drawings, she said, I want, you know, she just did a Lothar, and then designed this, the Zen rocks with the green ball. That was her, uh, she said, that's, how, you know, just for your old, that's how she wanted it displayed because she did that drawing of that. This is an interesting painting. It's called Night Sea Crossing. It's another small oil, oil on canvas board. And Night Sea Crossing has to do with the going from the conscious to the unconscious in your dream world. So when you're asleep and you're just moving into that unconsciousness, that's what that represents with the, in the, in the uh, boat, in the water, the moon up in the sky there. So just that night sea crossing and that's never ending dream stream. And I like this one a lot, which is Morpheus, who's the god of dreams. Another mythological um, person had a lot of impact in her life. Well, the Buddha was a, was a, is an entity that Sarah was very much um, enthralled with. And these are called, they are, she did eight of these. They're the incarnations of the Buddha. The Buddha is featured in many of her works. So those again are those fabric sculptures that she did with no form, no decoration, just the essence, the aura, their natural aura. And this is called Primitive Maiden, like one of her clay forms there that goes with that. I, I, I think that's a, again, Ramsey did an incredible job of matching and organizing the work to make it, you know, so you can grasp, so you get a feel of all the different mediums. This painting is called Tower of Babylonia, and another, it's another mythological story. It has to do with uh, the Babylonians were building a tower to their gods, and they were working on it and working on it and getting close to the top, and God found out about it, and he could get very upset. And he spiked down on, spiked down on the workers and destroyed the tower and sent them off throughout and sent them babbling off throughout the world and that was the origin one of the origins of mythological origins of how language started because these people these workers had got all over the world just babbling and everyone speaking differently and that's how different languages evolved which i think is uh, an interesting how you know, it's another mythological story that is interwoven in sarah's work hard to photograph they're really hard to see to get a good picture of them, but they have that eerie dream, subconscious, unconscious uh, feel to them, you know, in some kind of a dream world or dream state. And uh, those, uh, anyway, so there was 140 of those, and that was one of the first things we did is I framed those, we bought cases of frames, and we were able to get those frames so that we could actually view them and look at them without damaging them. So, that was sort of an interesting part of Sarah and her work because that's how private it was. She was just, she was just working and doing her thing. Um, you know, it was just never ending. She, her work, her drawing, her baking of breads and foods was exceptional, whole, holistic, healthy. She was an organic gardener. She was, did practice her own form of yoga and uh, was just really an interesting, interesting human being and been real blessed to I've had her as a mother and a business partner and friend and uh, confidant and, and now we get to share her art with the world. Thank you.